and welcome to the American Cinema Foundation Movie Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined by my friend Eric to discuss the 2003 movie Elf, our favorite modern Christmas fairy tale. It stars Will Ferrell in his funniest role, Bob Newhart and Ed Asner in valedictory roles, it feels like, in their old age, a lovely young Zoe Deschanel at the beginning of her quirky, beautiful girl with a musical talent career, and uh, all sorts of other supporting cast. Andy Richter, you know him from Conan, Kyle Gass, who used to do Tenacious D with Jack Black, Peter Dinklage, who is of course famous now for Game of Thrones, and other assorted actors, including veteran James Caan, better known for, well, The Godfather. (laughs) It's a strange cast, but it's a lovely cast, and it's a lovely Christmas comedy directed by Jon Favreau, otherwise known for, say, making Iron Man, I suppose, is the popular title. So none of this is what you would expect. Nobody struck in this direction again. Not the cast, not the writer, not the director. Elf was one shot and one of a kind, but it was a great success. So Eric, thanks for joining me again. I'm glad we're doing a lovely comedic Christmas story for once and not our usual Hitchcock horror. (laughs) And please run us through the plot. Oh, sure, Titus. Yeah, it's a lovely film. It's a whimsical film and it draws from many previous Christmas holiday favorites. And I think that it pulls it together quite well. Like you said, it has an unusual ensemble cast, sort of a one-off deal. And I'm glad that it was because I think if they tried to duplicate or build on this sort of thing, it would have not been pretty. But yeah, we meet our main character, Buddy the Elf, right, Will Ferrell, who is an orphan. He's in a Catholic orphanage, and he climbs as an infant, a toddler, not quite a toddler, yet he's still crawling, into Santa's sack on Christmas Eve and is whisked off to the North Pole, where he ends up being uh, adopted by Bob Newhart, who is one of Santa's chief elves in charge of the sleigh, in fact, which ties into the plot in the end. And Ferrell's character, Buddy, grows up thinking that he is an elf. And of course, you get these great classic fish-out-of-water moments where they've built these miniature half-size sets that Will Ferrell interacts with. And eventually he comes to discover that, you know, there's just something not right. I'm just, I'm just not as competent as these other elves, especially at the crafting of toys. And so in a moment of darkness, one of Buddy's supervisors tries to give him a pep talk. And later Buddy overhears him discussing that, well, you know, he's not really an elf. And get this parallel to the whole, is Santa real that a lot of children go through, right? Buddy realizes that he's not an elf. His adoptive elf father, Bob Newhart, breaks the news to him, tells him something about his past. He uh, approaches Santa, played really bizarrely in some ways by Ed Asner, who makes actually a very good Santa. And he's set on the path to New York City to find his real father. His mother, we've learned, has died, never told his father that he even existed, uh, that she was pregnant. Uh, there were college romance that did not end in marriage. And so he goes to New York City where his father works in the Empire State Building and he has a snow globe to guide him, which is his, his map. There's wonderful images of him walking a la Lord of the Rings through this wilderness after he gets out of this animated Christmas land and he gets to New York City. He finds that his, his father, played by James Caan, who is a sort of disreputable and rather unethical publisher of children's books and has remarried with Mary Steenburgen as his wife, his sort of loveless marriage. They have a son that he's not connected to at all. And Buddy eventually finds himself in a department store uh, in Santa Land at Gimbel's and there meets uh, Elf. He initially thinks, of course, it's another Elf, but of course it's not. It's just a woman working in the store who he falls in love with. And he tries to connect with his father who tries to find ways to get rid of him. Mary Steenburgen, trying to be very loving, wants to introduce Buddy and make this whole blended family thing work. And uh, James Caan has badly botched a printing job. His boss is on the verge of firing him. And so they're going to bring in this famous children's author to sort this whole mess out, who turns out to be of diminutive stature, a a very imperial, uh, arrogant children's author. And Buddy assumes he is an elf. And there's this, this great comic fight scene. And the result is that James Caan is going to be fired. Santa comes to the town. Of course, this takes place on Christmas Eve to deliver his packages. But the lack of Christmas spirit grounds the sleigh in Central Park. Buddy goes in and tries to solve the problem, of course, bringing the truth of all of his stories to light. And through a rousing rendition of um, Santa Claus is coming to town, the the sleigh is magic is restored. The family is reunited. And Buddy goes on then with his father, uh, who's not been fired, to start their own publishing company. And of course, his story becomes their first great bestseller and launches them off on their career. 
yeah, happy end. Buddy finally gets to have a family of his own. We're told he married the elf played by Zoe de Chanel and they had a girl. This seems to be what the story is about. Will Ferrell, Buddy, starts by realizing that he doesn't really have a family at the North Pole. He goes to look for one in New York. His New York family doesn't work out for him, but he eventually forms a family of his own. He ends up being business partners with his dad, which is not exactly what he was looking for, but uh, there you go. It's a Will Ferrell movie, there's a lot of physical comedy. You're gonna see this guy who's 6'3", fight with Peter Dinklage, and it's hilarious. And his earnestness is maybe the most hilarious thing. He is really good at delivering that, being earnestly shocked and pleased. People mm-hmm. enjoy his comedy because he's such a great big guy and he looks so childish. He does what Robin Williams used to try to do, but he does it better. There is a certain temptation, therefore, to dismiss the entire movie as being as earnest as its protagonist is, but we think that's a mistake. Will Ferrell is caught in between a human world, for which he is too innocent, all sorts of bad things happen to him, and all sorts of good things come to him because he doesn't understand the ways of people. He is too childish, too innocent, everything that works for everybody else does not work for him. Everything that should work by rule and habit for everybody else is a series of accidents for him. On the other hand, he is just not skilled enough to be an elf. He is caught in between these Mm -hmm. two worlds. And so it's worth considering with some care. Will Ferrell plays here a version of a natural man, a very American, very democratic, very friendly version of a natural man. And you Mm -hmm. can see that its leading characteristics are that on the one hand, he has one thing that adults do have, skills. He knows how to make things with his hands. He knows how to make stuff out of wood. He knows how to make stuff out of paper. He can decorate everything for Christmas by himself and make the toys too. And that turns out to be a real job. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, he is like a child, not an adult, because he is innocent. That's how he is caught in between where people are in our world. He has the innocence of a child, but the fine motor skills and technical skills that children lack. On the other hand, for all his capacity to do a job like an adult, he is easily distracted, way too earnest, and he lacks any kind of savvy. He doesn't know how to deal with people. And so you can see how his ideal for pointing out what's strange about our world and he is, in a quiet way, an indictment of the society that he tries to fit in. So let's start with his start. As you mentioned, this is a 2003 movie, and we're told that 30 years before Buddy went from the North Pole to New York City, he went from New York City to the North Pole. He was a baby boy abandoned in an orphanage. Santa Claus comes to an orphanage, because Santa Claus delivers gifts to everybody, but we tend to think of Santa Claus as coming to people's family homes to give give gifts for families. Santa Claus is part of America's civil religion, and this is centered around families. Whereas here, our attention is attracted immediately to those who don't have a family. For all the respectability and the love of Christmas, there are people who are not included in it. Orphans above all. Yeah, and the whole structure of the the film offers both a, a celebration and a critique of family in the modern America. And it's interesting to not only a lot of the things in the design of the film point to the the 1960s and 70s, both in the the visual design, uh, the depiction of the North Pole, influenced by the Rankin Bass Company that produced these Christmas specials between 1960 and 2000 when the company folded. Most famously, the Rudolph special, right? And we also find, as you said, his origin is in circa 1970 to sort of the height of the sexual revolution. And his parents are, at that time, typical sort of cool 70s couple there's a sort of college yearbook photo we see of them, long hair and the leather coats. But this is not a this is not a relationship that's designed to bring about a family. It's part of the sexual revolution. And in that, there's this broken result that there's this situation where she becomes pregnant with a child, doesn't even tell the father. And we see this locus of the dysfunction of the modern American family, you know, with James Caan and his own, his, his second major love and played by Mary Steenburgen. And so there's this critique that the problems in the American family are going back to the, to the baby boomers and even before, to some extent, to the people that helped shape them. 
where the the domestic American model has kind of gone off the rails. And it and what do you do with somebody like Buddy who does not fit into that picture? But like you said, he does bring this otherwise earnestness and this this sort of this elf like quality is this sort of insistence on creating a world that's loving, right? And it's this love becomes embodied in his sort of embodiment of Christmas cheer is the the, the sort of stand in for that. Buddy is a true servant of Santa Claus. He really works for Christmas because he's such a believer. He believes that he should have a family or that he did have a family or could have a family because Christmas in America is about family. And it turns out he didn't, that from the beginning he was an abandoned child, not necessarily unloved or unwanted, but Mm -hmm. there was no family into which he could be born. And this marks actually the story. And I want to attract attention to another detail. You're told 30 years previous to a movie that seems contemporaneous to 2003. Well, that puts it right before Roe v. Wade, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that points silently to another form of criticism. What if the solution to unwanted children is now to abort them? Then you're not going to have this story about love finding family anymore. Yeah, there's some very dark elements in this picture that are sort of percolating under the surface, which I think is fine. I think most Christmas, the best Christmas stories have these dark elements, right? I mean, it is the darkest time of the year, and it seems an appropriate time, whether it's the ghosts and things and iterations, film versions of Scrooge and so forth. But yeah, I mean, Buddy comes looking for a father figure as well, which he had in the Bob Newhart character. He does have a sort of very loving father, but a father that can't fulfill all of the needs because he's not human and because he doesn't tell Buddy, Buddy doesn't actually fully fit into that world. And what he needs is his father and the James Conn figure is immediately is to reject him and try to pawn him off and to get rid of him in various ways, which sets up a lot of the comedy in the film as well. Yep, you're right that he does have a loving father in the Papa Elf character played by Bob Newhart, but that's the funny thing is that Papa Elf, just as much as his real father played by James Caan, are defined by their work. Yes. The elves are all work. Now, of course, yes. all work is fine for elves, but it turns out to be also the American way that people, men especially, define themselves through their work. Absolutely. And uh, that always threatens family. And of course, this is also a commentary on the, the latest two generations of America that free love was actually not able to to transform uh, either capitalism or the free market or the fact that the people have to work for a living and that they define themselves to a large extent by their jobs. If anything, the 80s were a restatement stronger than ever of the importance of work for personal identity. Indeed, what the 60s managed to destroy was not capitalism or work, it was the family. Mm -hmm. And that left work to be only more important than it had been before. Buddy is a creature of the 60s and 70s that's come to modern America. He's a walking, talking indictment. Whatever happened, how did he end up in this situation? And he's compared to this uh, new child that uh, his father in his very late years had another child who is a middle schooler now, Mm -hmm. a millennial actually. And this kid, he knows his mother loves him and he's safe at home, but he resents terribly the fact that his father doesn't have a lot of time for him and isn't really connected to him. And he's fairly miserable for that reason. He has no idea how to grow up to be a man because his father is so obsessed with being a man and has no time to be a father as well. And this kid is fairly unhappy and he's fairly loud about it. He doesn't trust people and he doesn't deal well with being a teenager. And that's, again, you need that for drama to have a story, to have something to make better or to redeem. But it also shows certain things about society that are by no means fun or pleasant or flattering. The family buddy finds in America is as dysfunctional as anything and Mm -hmm. doesn't seem to have much of a future. If anything, his would-be stepmother is so interested in becoming his stepmother because she hopes that he's going to fix things. That Mm -hmm. maybe the problem with her husband, it has to do with this original child. The child that was completely abandoned and neglected. And if the man can square with his past and do right, he will be able finally to become the family man that she wants him to be, but he can't be. So the possibility of the father of the family to become truly a father and to be redeemed, all of it suggests that his obsession with his work is a form of guilt. And the other thing that struck me is that 
the film has a lot of American flags in it, and it's set in New York City. And the father works in the Empire State Building, right? The great iconic uh, skyscraper. But there's also a film that's made in 2002, 2003. So we're right after 9-11. And, of course, the other great iconic structures in New York City have been destroyed. And there's no mention of any of that in the film. But the thing that struck me, having not seen it for several years, was the number of prominently displayed American flags in places and set dressings that wouldn't have even been necessary, like in the on the wall of the main office entrance uh, for James Conn's office. Throughout the film, there's this sense that New York is this representation of America. You know, New York is the setting of so many Christmas movies. And we find that the moment of the father's redemption, that I think is the moment when he joins in a community singing of this you know, modern secular carol, you know, you better watch out, you're, Santa Claus is coming to town. And when that happens, it's because Santa's sleigh cannot function anymore. There's not enough Christmas spirit. And there's a sense in the film throughout that there's a need also for community. And it becomes a reaffirmation of American civic uh, religion at the end, when the father can join both in this community singing that through this televised broadcast of this sleigh in Central Park is grounded because of lack of Christmas spirit. And, and Buddy brings his actual hyper-competent uh, mechanical skills to play to try to fix this 1960s jet, right? Uh, Bob Newhart makes this comment that it was in the 1960s that they had to build this jet engine to attach to the bottom of the sleigh because that's when the Christmas spirit really began to tank and people began to not believe in Santa Claus. And it's at, at this moment that James Conn character begins to actually believe that he realizes what Buddy's been telling him is true and that he needs to really connect with both of his sons and he joins in the singing of this carol and but he does it because the entire country or at least the entire city of new york city is being drawn into the community spirit as well and by restoring this then santa can go on and the and the, and the film can go on to its denouement yes i think you're right about the importance of 9-11 and what it did to america it's you know 9/11 didn't change the behavior of Americans. The only change is the TSA. Otherwise, life goes on as it was and more security. But the opinions of Americans changed. It became obvious all of a sudden uh, the, that danger and vulnerability were very real things, and this vulnerability revealed more and more vulnerabilities. And uh, you're perfectly right that the only strong point in the third act is this desperate insistence on the importance of Christmas for the community, for, as an expression of people's hopes that are somehow tied with Christmas, Christ, Christianity, because they're about miracles, but at the same time, they're no longer Christian because public America is not a Christian place in the way it was before. And the collapse of America's civil religion that's pointed astutely to have climaxed in the 60s or 70s is a catastrophe and it needs to be fixed mm. somehow. Just like Santa needs people to believe in Christmas for Christmas to go on, Americans need Christmas for America in a certain sense to go on. And that's why Americans need Santa more than Santa needs them, so to speak. Yeah. And so the solution of jobs or work, or in the case of Santa, technology to supplant the fact that people no longer believe in their communities is bound to fail. And this is also why even weak forms of community, even spontaneous, half-desperate singing of carols that aren't even Carol. Christmas <laughs> songs or carols or Christian, even that is a good thing because we're now in a situation where we have to take what we can get and build on it. Yeah. So the, the, the story of Buddy who comes to America is a story of redemption for America. Americans mm -hmm. desperately need to be reminded of the importance of family and the importance of Christmas and their connection as the center of America's civil religion, but to do it without nostalgia or bitterness or resentment. That's where Buddy's innocence comes into play. He knows he has to have a family and that that's what Christmas is about, but he never had a family. He's not bitter about having lost it. He's not full of recrimination for his deadbeat dad who wants to abandon him all over again now that he's met him. 
And it is this innocence, this willingness to love and desire to be loved in return within family that makes it possible for Buddy to redeem America. If, on the other hand, the movie were essentially and openly about complaining about how the 60s ruined everything, how the boomers ruined everything, how there's no more family, there's no more society, it would be miserable. That, mm -hmm. that would itself help destroy Christmas. It would make people even worse off than they were. And so somehow the point is to find a way to talk about the civil religion, that is to say Christmas in public America, faith in miracles, the community coming together in a spirit of giving and receiving gifts and doing all this with regard to the family and with the desire of people who don't have families to form families or to somehow be part of the family Christmas that America organizes, even if they themselves do not have families. All this is necessary and very hard to orchestrate. It is the case that at Christmas people who don't have families feel more miserable than they would otherwise, and that's because everybody else has families and American Christmas is about family bringing people together with a certain hope for Christmas and a certain desire for family without making people who don't have that feel miserable and without making people who long for the old civil religion bitter about its demise. This is very difficult and this kind of very tender, very silly comedy is the wise, prudent way to do it. For that reason, we've, we've been trying to go through the details of the plot and of the characters to show just how thoughtful it is and how realistic, how open to the ugly truth about America, not just the beautiful truth about America. It's a story that talks not just about all the things that America has, but also about the things that it has lost and the things that it needs to gain again. The movie does fall squarely on the side of the civil religion. It just says we need a new way to build it because the old society is not there anymore. Work isn't going to emphasize family. Christianity isn't part of the public face of commerce and consumerism and materialism. And there's nothing you can do to fix that. You can work with it. You can't wish it away. There are a couple of other things, jokes, that have a certain deep meaning to them. Will Ferrell Buddy gets into a fight with the great writer, played by uh, Peter Dinklage, because he calls him an elf. Mm -hmm. And Peter Dinklage doesn't like that, and they get into a fight. But there's a meaning there. For Buddy, elves are great, because elves have great skills of making. They can make stuff with their hands in ways people don't understand. They're just, that's their magical power. And on the other hand, this other guy called an elf, who isn't really, has a power of making things up, not of making things. He's a writer of stories who takes it like a pro. He's got a notebook where he's got all sorts of great story ideas to sell to whoever pays him the kinds of money he now commands, as you put it so imperiously. But there's a problem with those stories, and there's a problem with that kind of making things up. The guy isn't really an elf. This is the meaning of the fight. Buddy has to get into a fight with him because Buddy really believes in elves and that elves are good. This guy is sort of like an elf. He's got a certain power of making, but he has no investment in what children's books mean to America. Children's books are, again, a way to emphasize the family basis of the civil religion in America. Children's books don't make sense without the American family. That's the whole raison d'etre of the industry. But the industry, like so many others, has abandoned that, has left it behind. And here you have the best writer, feared and revered, lavishly remunerated, who is utterly cynical about what he's doing and who is for that reason corrupting Christmas and therefore an enemy to Buddy who has to fight him. As with the other enemies, Buddy loses. That's very important about him, that he, every fight he fights he loses because of his incompetence and his innocence. But every time he fights, this identifies a crucial problem in America's civil religion. This is downright uncanny. Although I'd point out he does win the snowball fight, so, you know, he doesn't lose every fight. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a good point. Well, it's uh, it's true that he does beat the children, and uh, <laughs> of course, it's 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 not exactly you know it's not his fight. It's his it's the yes. the kid brother's fight. But that's yeah. true. That is an exception. And the other thing that's interesting, the other in the other place of labor we see is this place of unremitting, unrewarding toil in the mailroom, where alcohol <laughs> and Buddy's innocence brings about a sort of revolution 
and a, a sense of, of joy to these people who otherwise live in this horrible basement dungeon situation and you know, toiling away. Yep. And so that we and we also see that you know here is the other side of of, of work in America for for people like James Kahn who commands the corner office. Work has its pressures, but it's not the, it is not the pr- pressures of the unseen Americans. I mean, in a way, we kind of get Trump's deplorables down in the mailroom. And yep. and there's a sense that even the Christmas spirit needs to revive them. We need to. The film really is, I think about both family and community and, and the fact that we need to find some way in modern America to bridge the gap between the two because we do have people who don't have families. The guy that's in the mailroom is an ex-convict, right? He's on work release or a parole, parole at this point. There's this, this sense that you know we have to find a way to incorporate people who are not necessarily part of uh, the traditional nuclear family. But the film's also about the restoration of family, right? Buddy's going out to restore a family and it, it unlike a lot of films that have been made since the 1990s and uh, this new P.T. Barnum picture that's coming out where family is something that you can make from anything. Well, family, you just cannot make family from anything. You just cannot put ad hoc families together. But that doesn't mean people who don't have family shouldn't also be part of communities. And this film recognizes that distinction. Yes, I think you're right. And the mailroom scene is uh, also important. Buddy, in his innocence, treats a convict like a fellow human being. Exactly. He doesn't Mm -hmm. react with fear, suspicion, contempt, moralistic blame. And this is not to say that that you should take everybody out of jail or that there should be no punishment. That's far from the point. The point Mm -hmm. is that those people too are part of America. And they should be in some way a dignified part of America or have a chance to be dignified. And Buddy spontaneously creates a Christmas party that actually works for the people partying there. You do see that a Christmas party is a sorry replacement for a family, but it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And they do it by getting drunk, and getting drunk is also a good thing. (laughs) Maybe alcohol isn't that good for your health, and nobody should be a drunkard for life. But uh, getting drunk and forgetting about some of life's sorrows... And feeling some friendship for other people is a good thing. That's another yes. thing you don't see so much of. And yeah. it's part of how the story manages to deliver varieties of happy fellowship, of friendship. Not just family, these other things too. And does it through comic and ridiculous methods. Mm-hmm. But they all point to serious things and they achieve serious results. In that sense, the mailroom is a far happier place than the boardroom where people are so competitive that they live with great insecurity. And they find this immiserating because their great insecurity goes together with their great expectations and in sense of entitlement about what they're owed. And there is nothing that can redeem the boardroom mm-hmm. in, in this story. It's firmly on the side of the mailroom. And at the same time, it's very much aware that the old American dream, part of America's civil religion was that men worked, and part of the dignity of work for men was tied up. Not all of it, but part was tied up with going from the mailroom to the boardroom. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. And this film shows you that very clearly. And in an America where people who work in the mailroom are never going to dream even of the boardroom, much less make it there, alcohol is a good substitute. It's a realistic way of coping dealing with the situation. And so we get to how Buddy turns out to replace the elves and to be able to form a family and to eventually visit the elves. He has finally a way of taking his own daughter and family to the North Pole. At the, he can bring them to Christmas. He can bring Christmas to them. Buddy ends up a writer of his own experience as a fake elf and as a true human being. He is a success story that America can believe in. The opposite of, say, a business success story and anything of that character. It's it's a kind of success story that America can believe in because it restores America's civil religion. It's a family success story. And his family success story depends on the success of family stories. He sells children's books, and because this is America, he starts with an autobiography from Emerson telling you that uh, in America, everybody has one good book in him, if only he listens, if only he pays attention to his own life and experience. That is to say, every autobiography could be good. That's the American promise. You could 
live your life and reflect on your experience in such a way that you could produce a good book. And that's a certain way of justifying yourself publicly and psychologically in your own reflections. From that all the way to our times when we prefer true stories. We want the facts and we want the facts to be good. We don't want ugly facts. This is all put together in a buddy who becomes a writer and a successful one at that because he starts by telling his own true story to give America the idea that telling the truth could be good and that the truth about America could itself be good. It could be likable. It's a beautiful story and so people like it. And that's one thing. The other thing is personal to Buddy and we see it depicted in the story. He gets a job as an elf at the department store and this turns out to be very unglamorous and uh, failure, not like in old movies like Miracle on 34th Street. And there he meets this uh, girl who plays an elf, played by Zoe de Chanel, and they fall in love. One day she will be his wife, we are told. And the movie has this beautiful scene that nowadays maybe wouldn't be shot anymore. One morning, Buddy hears somebody singing. He lives in the department store because he has no home at this point. And he overnight there, like the magical elves, he turns the department store shabby Christmas look into a beautiful artisanal hipster craft <laughs> uh, version of Christmas decorations. And in the morning he hears somebody singing and he goes following the song and then he sings along to Zoe de Chanel who is uh, doing her half of Baby It's Cold Outside. And this uh, love duet brings them together for the first time in song. They hear each other, they sing to each other, and that's the first expression of their longing for love and of Buddy's innocence. He's drawn by the beauty of the song, and we're expected to believe that he knows the song, which of course he couldn't possibly know. But it's supposed to come out of him spontaneously as an expression of wooing. It's a song about seduction and it is beautiful and it's about bringing man and woman together. And this makes of Buddy a man who is otherwise a child. And so this is all happening on the other hand in the showers in the company uh, <laughs> in the department store. And the woman is singing naked in the shower. He doesn't quite know that because he's sitting outside. But on the other hand, he's outside the woman's shower. <laughs> and of course, she <laughs> ends up uh, feeling creeped out by it. Nowadays, this might be sexual harassment. It's hard to say. Just like Baby It's Cold Outside is routinely subjected to stupid liberal criticism. But it's remarkable, both as a comic sequence and also as a way to connect the beauty and the romance to love and what eventually will be family. And the song originated with Frank Losser and his wife. They used to be a hit at parties where they would close the evening by doing Baby It's Cold Outside as husband and wife. It's uh, wry, it's uh, knowing, it nods at eroticism and seduction and very playful. And uh, for that reason, although it's not a carol, it's not Christian, it's not a Christmas song really, it fits perfectly with this theme of finding the basis of family and of love wherever you can and working with it and making it happen. Yeah. And that's comedy. It doesn't work with exalted and sacred things. It works with the most ridiculous things, but for, the, for this good purpose of restoring the civil religion. Well, Eric, I think that about wraps our thoughts on Elf. It's a lovely movie and we hope to have shown it's also very insightful if you think about it. And uh, it's a case of the thoughtful stuff working out fairly well with the pleasant stuff so that it turns from a story of how Christmas and family worked out for this mythical creature, Buddy, into a how-to guide, the reflections and advice for how things could make for better Christmas, how things could make for love, for friendship, for family. Thanks for joining me, and uh, as I said, it's good to do a funny uh, story, a comedy for once, and not our usual Hitchcock. Yeah, it's, it, and yet, you know, as we know, that comedy can often be a door into insights, and it is a, a lovely a lovingly crafted film that's full of everything from slapstick to some really deep insights into America. So thank you very much, Titus, for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>